Uh, welcome, everybody, to this most recent Office Hours. Uh, this is sort of a redo from last week uh, when significant connectivity problems that might or might not be attributable to the uh, significant snowstorm that we had here in Boulder occurred, and I had to sort of truncate that one early. Uh, got a little bit of information out, but for the most part, that was not a successful session, so apologies for that. Uh, what I will be doing today uh, is to try and recreate last week, essentially in the sense that today will be a, a fairly unstructured, ask me anything style session. Um, ideally, climate focused uh, anything's, but uh, we'll see where the we'll see where the questions go, and talk a little bit about. Uh, the weather to come in California. There's nothing extreme on the horizon, uh, but there is a potentially a more active period once again. I can talk briefly about the uh, active period of thunderstorms uh, in, that occurred in Southern California in the past few days, uh, which uh, were pretty conspicuous since they affected, uh, although fairly isolated areas, also quite heavily populated areas. So a lot of folks actually experienced those downpours uh, and those storms uh, and yeah that's uh, this is not going to be a particularly formal session uh, I want to leave a lot of time for for questions and interactive discussion for those who have joined today uh, there's about 60 of you or so on there right now that number will probably rise although we do I do tend to see the larger numbers in the midst of extreme weather events and we're not currently uh, experiencing one of those in California at the moment. Uh, so I will say that the ratio of viewers to me is uh, is uh, lower than, than usual, and so the chance of your question being answered live on air is higher than during one of the sessions where there's lots of people. So even as those numbers tick up, the odds are good today. Um, so I'll start with a few uh, summative pieces. Last time I showed uh, how the winter 2023-24 in California was wetter than average, essentially in all coastal areas, and uh, fairly dramatically wetter than average in some parts of the central coast and the south coast of California. Uh, generally, more anomalously wet the farther south you go. Uh, the exception would be the Sierra Nevada, where many spots were near or even below average for the seasonal precipitation, not by a lot, but it was in fairly stark contrast to coastal areas that were much wetter than average. So there was a bit of a north to south gradient. In general, it was more anomalously wet in the south and the north, but there was also an east to west gradient, or I should say a west to east gradient, in the sense that the coast was more anomalously wet than the mountains, which actually were in some cases a bit drier than usual. We did end uh, February and headed into mid-March where we are now, with a statewide snowpack that actually looked pretty good. We're, we're pretty close to average, or even a little bit above average, uh, almost exclusively thanks to that very intense sequence of storms that occurred in January into February that dropped a huge amount of snow and the Sierra blizzard that occurred uh, at the very beginning, I believe it was the beginning of March, end of February, beginning of March. Uh, of course, weather right now, much quieter. It's warm and even mild. There have been some 70 and 80 degree temperatures. Uh, although there has also been some active weather in Southern California where that cutoff low over the desert southwest brought just enough unstable air, uh, cold air aloft, warm air at the surface, plus uh, some moisture around is enough to generate some thunderstorms over the mountains in Southern California. But because this low pressure system is located to the east of Southern California rather than to the west, the reflow, sometimes called return flow, on the westward flank of the low pressure system was actually from north to south, or northeast east to southwestward, meaning those thunderstorms that blew up over the mountains did not stay over the mountains, and in fact moved out over the coastal valleys and plains, and so places even like uh, Los Angeles and Orange County and San Diego County, right along the beaches, saw some pretty hefty thunderstorm activity over the past 48 hours wasn't extremely widespread, uh, but it was fairly intense where it did occur. There were some severe thunderstorm warnings, there were some very heavy downpours, some accumulating hail, and of course some lightning. So uh, not entirely unusual for late March, but the direction of flow was unusual, and I think the storms caught a lot of folks by surprise because uh, 
Uh, well, not because they were not in the official forecast from the National Weather Service, they, they were there, not because the weather models did not capture this pattern, they did a pretty decent job suggesting that there would indeed be widely scattered, locally stronger thunderstorms across Southern California the past couple of days, uh, but in fact because, and again this is a bit of conjecture, but I think this is probably what happened is a lot of folks saying uh, that these storms came out of nowhere, they weren't in the forecast, well they probably weren't in the forecast if you were using most weather apps on your phone, on your computer, uh, because essentially the we these weather apps are very bad at uh, talking about uh, conditions that occur with maybe 20 or 30 percent probability or that occur only scattered across the landscape over maybe 20 or 30 percent of the area. You'll often get an icon that will say sunny or partly cloudy if there's a 30 percent chance of thunderstorms. Uh, the reality is, of course, 70% of the area probably will end up remaining dry or thunderstorm free, but if you're on the 30% of the area under the thunderstorm, that's a pretty different change in conditions, and it's not inconsistent with the forecast uh, with a 20 or 30% chance of thunderstorms to see anything from sunny skies to uh, torrential downpours with lightning and hail. That, that is the range of outcomes that you get when you have isolated and scattered thunderstorms around this time of year. So. It is an interesting weather science communication challenge. It's actually not a weather prediction challenge in the same sense as it is a how do we communicate uh, 20 and 30 percent probability of events to people uh, in an era where most people get that information by looking at a single icon. Um, how do we capture that? Um, the Weather Channel, uh, somewhat ironically, kind of figured that out decades ago with different levels of thunderstorm icons for 10, 20, and greater than 40% likelihood. Uh, but anyway, um, interesting food for thought. This was not really an event that came out of nowhere. It was not a large-scale storm. These are isolated, but sometimes very intense thunderstorm downpours. They were officially in the forecast. They were exactly what you'd expect to see in a pattern like this. They were pretty visually spectacular. A lot of folks got some good photos. I don't think they caused too much harm other than some traffic jams. Uh, so probably um, a net uh, neutral thing uh, in, in that respect. But some good, uh, good cloud watching, some isolated downpours, and interesting conversation about talking about weather forecasts uh, and how we interpret them, especially in light of uh, events that are spatially non-uniform or a little bit out of the norm. Uh, hopefully, by the way, this stream is clear, uh, both in audio and in video. I did test, things are looking better. Uh, I still am not 100% sure whether the last interruption was due to snow or squirrels. Um, I'm hoping it was snow, because that has gone away. The squirrels have not. Um, they, they have um, appeared to be ever more prevalent, much as squirrels do uh, tend to do in the spring, uh, with other, along with other small mammals. So. We'll see how that goes, but uh, no snow on the wires right now, in any case. Uh, so where are we now? You know, in se seasonally, we've got a year, the second year, in fact, where most of California was much wetter than average, especially along the coast. Uh, and even in the Sierra Nevada, last winter was a lot wetter than this year, where there's a, t a lot more snow last year. But this ended up not being a terrible snow year. You know, we're, we're up pretty close to where we should be for mid to late March in terms of snow water equivalent. So in the Sierra, it's back to back years of near to above average, and in the rest of the state, it's essentially back to back above average, wetter than average years. But this year is still different from last year for a few reasons. One is that it's not as extremely anomalously wet in, mo in many places as it was this time last year. So although it is much wetter than average, it's not as wet in comparative terms as last year, although there are a few places in Southern California where the reverse is true. It's also not nearly as cold as last winter. So last winter was wet and cold. This year was wet and warm. And it may not have felt like that everywhere, but on a statewide basis, this was an unusually warm winter. And in fact, in the San Joaquin Valley, this was perhaps either the warmest or second warmest winter on record. So that brings about some different characteristics. This snowpack, while it's substantial, is not going to stick around as long as last year's did, just based on climatology and the global warming trend, which is causing the snowpack to melt earlier in the season and more completely by summer. 
Uh, but also we're heading into what appears to be a significant La Nina-like pattern. El Nino is rapidly fading and will likely be gone within a matter of weeks. Whether it persists beyond the end of March is really in question. So the influence of El Nino is rapidly fading. Not too surprising because it would already be fading even if it were still present in the tropics as we get into late March and early April. But what this means is that this summer will not likely be dominated by a global atmospheric pattern that is El Nino-like. It will be more La Nina-like, and that may mean uh, some important differences, especially for Atlantic hurricane season, but also for some things closer to home. One is that it's not perhaps as likely that we'll see such a slow start to the summer of this year as we did last year. So we may continue to see a relatively active spring, maybe even a relatively mild and wet spring. That would be nice. But I, I don't think it's as likely that we're going to escape big heat waves this summer and into next fall. And the likelihood that next autumn is warm and dry is probably a lot higher uh, than this past autumn. The likelihood of seeing a late season tropical system that brings widespread rainfall to California and kind of decapitates fire season, if you will, as we saw this year with Hurricane Hillary, which really just brought a record-breaking rain event to Southern California and just... Uh, just really sort of ended fire season in a lot of places. Not impossible this year, but I think it's even less likely than it would normally be, probably from later the summer into the fall. So the likelihood that this year's fire season is significantly more active than last year goes up considerably because the snowpack is not exceptionally large, although it is not bad, it is near average. But more importantly, because we have not had as cold of a winter, we probably won't have as cold as the spring, and the summer will probably be warmer too, along with there being a higher likelihood that we won't see an early end to fire season in autumn. So whatever offshore wind events do occur late in the season might be more likely to coincide with significantly drier vegetation conditions than occurred uh, last year. So last year was an exceptionally mild fire season in most of California, except for parts of the far northwest of the state. Even there, it was certainly not the worst on record, although it was active. Everywhere else, it was almost a non-season. I, I would be somewhat surprised if this year was not significantly more active. That's different than calling for an extremely active season. I do think we are going to see the legacy of both this and the last winter, both of which were two consecutive wet years, uh, manifested. Now, in some places, that can actually increase fire risk because in what are known as vegetation-limited regimes, so places where there's pretty sparse vegetation to begin with, in the wet years, you get more vegetation growth and you often get more wildfire activity. That would be true in the deserts and in some of the coastal chaparral environments in Southern California. So wetter years sometimes are actually more active fire years in those places. The reverse is true mainly in the forests where it's the big dry years that are the intense fire years. This year might be a little bit of a mix it may not be a big year in the forested regions again because, again, this is the second consecutive wet year and the second consecutive year with the least average snowpack or higher. So it may well be that we don't see a big upper elevation fire season yet again this year. But at low to middle elevations, I do think this year will probably be more active than last year because it's not been as exceptionally wet and this summer probably and autumn will end up drying out and warming up more than last year. So we have the benefit of having all this extra vegetation growth from the wet conditions the past couple of years, and now we might start to dry out some more. That's a little bit speculative, but that's, my, that's sort of where I'm leaning right now. The big question is what happens the next time we get a really dry year. 2024 uh, ain't going to be it because it's already too wet for 2024 to be a really dry year overall. So this year won't be an exceptionally dry year. It could dry out more than expected if this summer and autumn are exceptionally hot, but that is not really something we have the ability to predict right now. But I will say that next time California sees a sequence of one to two very dry years and, very, or, and or very hot years, which statistically will likely happen sooner rather than later, and perhaps even next year if predictions of a particularly strong La Nina event come to pass with the usual global warming trend on top of it, then that suggests that we might see quite a large spike in wildfire activity very suddenly in some year. I'm not so sure it's going to be this year. In fact, I think that it might actually not be until next year or the year after that we see that big spike in wildfire activity. Because again, what we would probably need to see 
what we have seen recently is a huge amount of vegetation growth and regrowth, including in a lot of the burn areas from the 2010s. So a lot of the places that burned in the last decade, the last couple of wet years have helped them fill in considerably with brush and some younger trees, saplings moving in. That's good from a regeneration perspective in many cases, but it also means that the fuel load is, is once again essentially reloading. Uh, and that the fuels are now contiguous enough to support fires in most of these burn areas, including fast-moving and potentially intense fires if conditions are favorable. Now, I'm not sure we'll see those favorable conditions this year, but we, we almost certainly will the next time things really warm up and dry out a lot. And so, you know, this, 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 these headlines I've seen about how California wildfires have decreased a lot in five years are almost meaningless because there is a lot of variability, you know, on three to five year periods, partly associated with El Nino and La Nina, and partly associated with random variability, but it doesn't make sense to be talking about five year trends in wildfire activity. Like it's just scientifically and practically nonsensical because we still know that the long-term trend is toward much more severe wildfire burning conditions in the long run. And that will manifest itself as we lurch forward with these big jumps between the quiescent periods and the even more extreme episodes in between them. I think we're probably a year to two years out from seeing that next big lurch. If it's particularly hot and dry this summer and fall, maybe it'll happen earlier. But I think this year is probably too wet with too decent of a snowpack for it to be an extremely active year on par with some of the most active years historically. But that could change very quickly the next time we get a dry year. And there are some very fuzzy indications that might now happen next year. So just thinking ahead a bit. I do think this year will be a more active fire season than last year, but that's not saying much because last year was very inactive in California. Of course, if you go up to Canada, just the completely opposite story this year has all the hallmarks of another catastrophic fire season, especially in Western Canada with the very severe winter drought there now. And frankly, some of the fires that were burning last summer have already reemerged. The, the zombie fires, as they have now been called by a number of fire researchers, are already reemerging in the same places that they were uh, and incompletely extinguished at the end of last season because this has been such a record warm and dry winter up there. So a bit far afield, but uh, a different part of North America that's not likely to see uh, the benefits from recent wet conditions that California might continue to enjoy this year to a certain extent. And then the last thing I wanted to, to uh, discuss in the monologue, see I'm trying to keep it short within the first 20 or 30 minutes uh, before going to the question section, Q&A, ask me anything section. So uh, if you've asked a question, uh, I will get to it. Uh, feel free to start adding them now as I continue here. But the, uh, the upcoming weather pattern in California looks uh, like it's going to get more active again. I know we've had those isolated thunderstorms in Southern California that were a bit exciting the last few days, but overall it's been a relatively mild pattern statewide. It's actually been pretty warm. Even in Southern California, some of those thunderstorm zones were 70 plus degrees, so it definitely has warmed up in recent days. That'll continue for a few more days, but in about a week or so, uh, really by this weekend, I guess that's less than a week out now, uh, probably see a shift to a cooler and wetter pattern once again uh, for the end of March, maybe going into early April with relatively cold storms uh, thereafter. That's relatively good news. These actually look like they will be decent snow producing storms, probably will ma maintain that snowpack at or right around average for the next few weeks heading into uh, into early April. And frankly, that means that the April 1st snow uh, metric is probably going to be right around or maybe even a little bit above 100% of the April 1st average. An unusually average value in a, a place and in a decade and in an era where average uh, is, is not too accurate a descriptor of what happens most of the time. So this might be a end up being a remarkably average uh, snow season. Of course, if you look into it, it's not really an average snow season because it was it started out as a record uh, record low snow snowpack in many places up through December or even early January. I was in South Lake Tahoe in early January and there was frankly very little snow on the ground. Uh, even at 7,000 feet, there was very little snow on the ground. But that turned around very quickly. So we've seen a, a, a truncated snow season, but we've benefited from some very wet storms, very cold and wet storms combined. 
that really bolstered that snowpack uh, in the meantime. So, uh, so I think that the pattern coming up, it doesn't currently look like there'll be any extreme storms, uh, but they look like they, some of them could be weaker uh, than others, others may be a bit stronger, there will be a sequence of several of them at least, they all look fairly cold, they all look like fairly decent snow producers, no extreme blizzards probably, but some periods of heavy snowfall potentially, and given the time of year and the cold air aloft, almost all of them will probably coincide with at least isolated thunderstorms, and that just seems to be the theme this year, that every single storm that's affected California has brought some thunderstorm activity, including some severe thunderstorms. It's too early to talk about the potential for severe thunderstorms, but when we do see these sorts of slow-moving uh, low-pressure systems with a lot of cold air aloft and some de decent jet support as we head into late March and early April in California, that does tend to be the prototypical pattern where we get those uh, isolated to scattered thunderstorms and maybe even a, a handful of isolated uh, mini supercell type severe thunderstorm structures, especially in the Central Valley, some of the SoCal coastal areas, but occasionally elsewhere too. Too fuzzy, it's too far out to be specific about the details, but I would not be surprised if this upcoming weak to moderate cold storm sequence brings another round or two of interesting convective weather, maybe even including some a few severe thunderstorms once again. Um, this winter definitely has my thinking cap uh, buzzing, if that expression makes any sense, maybe not, uh, about the potential for more interesting convective weather in a warming climate in California. It's not something that anybody has examined with any scientific rigor that I'm aware of, uh, but there are plausible reasons to suspect that there might be some interesting things that might change as the amount of surface-based instability increases. It might not increase by a lot, but frankly, California is one of those edge cases where the typical values are so low that even a small absolute increase in atmospheric instability might actually be a meaningfully significant relative increase compared to the historical baseline. And frankly, this year and last year are two examples of winters that featured, winters and springs really, that featured more thunderstorms in California than I can really remember for many years before that. Are we just in a, a cycle with some enhanced convective energy in the near shore waters relative to the past 20 years. Maybe it's just, uh, maybe it's just perception. Maybe it's just a qualitative bias there, but that's the whole point of, of actually running a formal scientific study is that you test a hypothesis that might come from a gut feeling, but you actually test to see whether it's correct or not and whether the evidence and the data bear that out. I don't know if it does, frankly, although there are reasons to suspect it would be plausible. Uh, given the fact that almost everywhere on Earth, outside of the deep tropics and the polar regions, are expected to see some increase in surface-based convective instability in a warming climate. This is one of those not quite universal but close to it things uh, that California is probably not immune from. It's probably more consequential in some places than others because California has never been an epicenter for severe thunderstorms and tornadoes and large hail, but they do happen occasionally, and they have happened this year and last year, not as extremely uh, as uh, as in some other parts of the world, particularly the central U.S., but let's just put it this way. The number of photogenic supercell thunderstorms and photogenic tornadoes and even damaging tornadoes in California over the past couple of years has been a lot higher than a lot of other states in the country, including some states that traditionally saw more of those uh, than California did. So just some interesting food for thought. I do speculate in these sessions, by the way. And informed speculation is one of the things that you get in these sessions that I tend to do less of elsewhere. Uh, it gets me into trouble sometimes, uh, I, to be quite honest, but I think it's worth it because I think these are interesting conversations, hopefully, um, and sometimes saying it aloud actually helps you uh, formulate research hypotheses or uh, sometimes folks will reach out to me, research collaborators. Anyway, um, please take that uh, as it is, which is to say, inform speculation, uh, but not without some evidence, just without a lot of evidence. Maybe that's the way to put it. All right, so we're getting close to the half hour, so I did say this was an Ask Me Anything session, um, so ask me anything. Um, primarily climate related, secondarily weather related, but I suppose more broad is also appropriate um, on a day like today. So um, pretty open-ended questions. Let's try and keep them weather and climate related as much as possible, but otherwise the floor is yours.
Uh, and there are some that have come in already. I'm going to start with the ones that are in. Um, you might briefly see an ad as I take a sip of water and as I read some of the questions, but I'm still here and will begin answering momentarily. So uh, the silence is me reading and taking a sip of water. All right, folks, uh, thanks for bearing with me through the brief break. I've now had my water. You've probably seen your ad if that popped up. Um, all right, so the first question slash comment is that this winter I've noticed all kinds of crazy erratic cloud shapes that I've never seen before over my area here in coastal uh, Los Angeles. Is this an anomaly or the new normal? Uh, I can believe that this has been a particularly interesting cloud watching year in coastal Southern California because, frankly, it's just been a very active year in general. In fact, 2023 24 may be one of the most consistently active weather periods in Southern California that I can remember in history, uh, partly because it started in the middle of summer. You know, in August, there was some amazing cloud watching. Uh, during the Tropical Storm Hillary episode, uh, which, as it turns out, by the way, did not officially make landfall in California, but that's a bit of an esoteric distinction because, of course, it brought the impacts that it did in terms of uh, record-breaking rainfall, flooding, and even some strong winds. Uh, but this started in August with some amazing wave clouds and some amazing Mamatis clouds uh, from Hillary, that continued into autumn, uh, where there were a couple of episodes of cutoff low pressure systems that brought significant thunderstorm activity. And of course, I always think that thunderstorm clouds are, in many ways, the most interesting clouds. I, that's, a, that's a matter of opinion, uh, but it, it's always a bit of a treat when they show up in California for cloud watchers and, and weather geeks because they're not super common in coastal California. In fact, they're less common there than almost anywhere else, almost any other continental populated region on Earth outside of the Sahara Desert and the Atacama Desert. Uh, of course, you don't see them too much in Antarctica either, but unless you're a research scientist on, a, on an assignment at the polar base, you don't really spend a lot of time there uh, in terms of humans. Anyway, uh, so I think that, you know, this winter, there's been a lot of, there has probably been a lot of interesting clouds. There's been wave clouds, there's been orographic clouds, there's been thunderstorm clouds and cumulonimbus clouds. So I believe it. Uh, in fact, I've seen a lot of these, and even in between the storm systems, sort of these subtropical air masses, these warm, stable air masses in between storms have brought those sort of tropical, subtropical stratocumulus clouds, which are sort of produce those infamous or famous Hawaii-like sunsets with lots of clouds at the right elevation and angle for the low angle sun in the winter evening to make them very red and orange for a huge period of time over a vast fraction of the sky. So I, I totally believe it. And I think they're probably, if there, were, if there were a way to quantify the interesting, the prevalence of interesting clouds quantitatively, I would bet you that this year probably would score very highly in coastal Southern California. So I think your perception is right there. Interesting question of whether it's an anomaly or the new normal. We do expect to see more powerful atmospheric rivers in a warming climate, although atmospheric rivers in California don't always bring the most interesting clouds. In fact, sometimes they bring kind of boring uniform cloud decks, uh, despite the dramatic weather that they can bring at the surface. In terms of these thunderstorm clouds, that's a bit speculative, although as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the more convective instability there is, the more the easier it is to get those bubbly convective cumulonimbus clouds. So, so maybe. Um, maybe if there were a, a climate change study on the interestingness of clouds, maybe there would be an increase in, in Southern California in a warming climate. It's a very qualitative assessment, but, you know, it's, it's at least somewhat plausible, but I definitely can see how this year would be an especially interesting year. Interesting question. Would be kind of interesting to quantify trends in cloud types, but then we'd have to have a systematic way of classifying that. There was some folks who did that with AI a while back, but then it turned out that it still wasn't as good as humans uh, in doing that classification. Although I wonder if that's still true because that's like a classic image classification challenge. Um, a lot of those initial AI models, by the way, were so good because they had uh, access to 
human validated data sets you know those cat versus dog data sets originally there were a lot of humans who sat there tagging whether or not the image was in fact a cat or a dog before those models were trained on that data set the question is could we get a similarly high quality data set for cloud types i don't know maybe somebody's already done this it seems like an interesting problem probably without very many commercial applications and so very possibly it hasn't happened but interesting uh There's a question uh, about learning the basics of meteorology and climate science and whether I have uh, a recommended resource. Uh, that is a good question. I don't have a great answer right now, except that one really useful tool uh, is actually something that is put out by the National Center for Atmospheric Research. It's an online learning center. It, it's called uh, Comet, C-O-M-E-T. Uh, or Comet MetEd, for, short for Meteorological Education, and they have a lot of modules that you can go through. Some of them gets, they're, they're fairly broadly accessible if you have at least a nominal science background or quantitative background. Some, they, some of them are more complicated and more involved than others. They are actually used as an adjunct material in some university level meteorological courses. So your mileage may vary, but I do believe that you can sign up for that for free. I think it's, I do think it's open to the public and some of the modules are designed to be in, introductory level without really much background at all. So that might be a good place to start for some of the basics in terms of weather and climate processes, but I'll think about that a bit, uh, maybe and get back to folks uh, at a later date. That was uh, related to Deborah's question as well. Uh, Erica asks if I'll be presenting anything at the upcoming, I think that's the uh, International Atmospheric Rivers Conference this year. Uh, uh, this year, unfortunately, no. Uh, I've been, uh, the, the unfortunate reality is that I, 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 uh, I'm constantly overbooked these days. You know, I, there's, I, I wish I could say yes to everything, but uh, I still probably say yes to too many things, and yet I still say no to 95% of the incoming requests. And it's still, it's still too much, uh, unfortunately. So there are only so many days in the year. I won't be there this year. Uh, but it is a cool conference. Uh, I have been there in person once and virtually uh, on, a, on a different occasion, I believe. Uh, and I will, um, I'll try and follow the conference proceedings and the papers that come out of it because I, I do keep close tabs on the atmospheric river research that comes out, uh, particularly uh, the stuff that's California and Western US focused. So I'll keep a close eye out for that. Uh, Mighty Mia asks about uh, summer weather predictions for California. I gave some vague hints earlier. Uh, really, we can't say more than that at this point, and we don't have a huge degree of seasonal predictability generally. So. What I'll be looking for in the next couple of months is uh, whether there's a strong warm signal uh, for the summer, because that's really the only piece of this that is predictable. And then in the autumn, is there a strong warm and or dry signal? Because we, there is some predictability in terms of years that are super dry in autumn, and that will tell us a bit about fire season, potentially. So stay tuned for that, but otherwise, it's too early for more than vague hints, and really, it's honestly uh, scientifically at the margin of reasonability to even give those vague hints at this early juncture. A comment uh, about not being ready for spring or summer, and that it felt like a very warm winter with little snow below 5,000 feet in northwestern California. I think that is an accurate assessment. It hasn't been dry, necessarily. There's been a plenty of rain. But it has been a warmer than average winter, especially along the coast this year. Um, this has not been so true in the Sierra Nevada, but it has been true almost everywhere else. And we sometimes forget that there are other parts of the state that usually, or historically at least, saw significant snowpack. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure if I'm especially concerned about this year's fire season, given how wet it's been in general the past two years. But again, if we get a hot summer and a dry fall, then it could be off to the races again in some places that weren't exceptionally wet this year and last year. So I don't foresee this as being particularly likely to be a especially severe fire season in that part of the state, but 
A, that, that could change depending on how conditions evolve, and there is a decent chance it'll be more, more active than last year. Question from Hank, can you say anything about dry lightning and bolt from the blue lightning strikes? Sure. These are two different phenomena. Dry lightning is lightning that occurs from a thunderstorm cloud that is producing little or no precipitation that's reaching the ground. Many of these clouds are producing plenty of precipitation, but the sub-cloud layer is so dry that all of, most or all of that water evaporates before it hits the ground. So dry lightning doesn't just occur out of thin air. It still occurs uh, as a result of thunderstorm clouds, cumulonimbus clouds. They, they do tend to be a bit shallower than their moist thunderstorm counterparts. So you do see cloud layers that are maybe only uh, 15, 10 or 15,000 feet deep instead of 25 to 45,000 feet tall, as the case of a wet thunderstorm, much of the time. But the main distinction is that, the, is that there's just very dry air in the subsurface layer of the cloud. And there are certain meteorological characteristics that make it more likely to get dry thunderstorms versus wet ones, but they are still being generated by thunderstorms. If it were daytime and you looked out at the cloud, you'd still see a bubbly cumulonimbus cloud. You just wouldn't be getting the rain reaching the surface. So that's what dry lightning is, and of course that's why it's such a fire risk, is that if you have these, uh, you know, these bolts of plasma, the, the equivalent uh, to the surface temperature of the sun hitting a tree in a dry forest, and it doesn't rain afterward, well, of course that is going to result in a, in a fire uh, something like 20 to 40 percent of the time. Sometimes it's surprising to me it isn't even higher percentage. Bolt from the blue, separately, is simply a lightning, a cloud to ground lightning strike, or a cloud to water, I guess, lightning strike potentially also, that occurs far from the parent thunderstorm cloud, hence the term bolt from the blue. It can actually occur as much as 10 or 20 miles away from the thunderstorm cloud, which means that if the cloud is 20 miles away, if you're on the dry side of the storm, it could be sunny and blue skies, and you can get a lightning strike at your location. It's kind of a nightmare scenario from a lightning safety perspective, and it's one of the reasons why the recommendation usually is to stay indoors or in some sort of safe shelter during a thunderstorm for 20 or 30 minutes after your last perceived lightning strike, because that sort of an informal rule of thumb that gives whatever the storm was that was producing the lightning some time to move on. Of course, it depends how quickly the storm is moving, Sometimes you're pretty safe in 10 minutes, and other times it might not really have moved very far at all in 20 or 30 minutes. But that's the general rule of thumb. And you can get these because the path that lightning takes is really quite stochastic. Of course, the highest likelihood of getting struck by lightning was going to be right underneath the parent storm cell, or at least under the anvil of the storm. So there is sort of an asymmetric likelihood of lightning that's sort of upwind of a thunderstorm, so more in the direction that the storm is moving ahead of it and under the anvil. But occasionally you can get strikes that are exactly in the opposite direction, behind the storm, in the clear air, and every once in a while those strike somebody who's really being, they think they're being reasonable by being outdoors following the storm, and it just, they didn't give it enough a margin. So it can happen. It's not common. You know, even as somebody who knows those risks, you know, sometimes I'll, you know, leave, leave the house a little bit early after a storm like that, because those strikes are rare, uh, but they do happen. And, you know, in terms of lightning safety, um, it is an important consideration. So um, it's also an interesting photographic opportunity, by the way, because sometimes you can get those spectacular shots. And I've seen a few of these recently where there's this huge bolt from the blue just coming out and landing 10 miles behind the storm. And it just looks very bizarre because you can see it coming out of this distant thunderstorm and landing very close to the photographer. So they're, they're, in those particular instances, they're lucky they weren't struck. But... Um, it can happen, uh, but it's a lot less likely than being uh, than, than than strikes occurring directly under the storm, as you'd expect. Thoughts about the Atlantic hurricane season? Um, don't normally talk about it too much, but this year, all signs point toward a a big bad season. I mean, ocean temperatures in the Atlantic they're record warm. They're not only record warm at the surface, but they're record warm in the subsurface. So even if you get some cold water mixing up from underneath, there's no cold water to mix up. You're just mixing up more record warm water. La Nina transition probably means that wind shear will be low, which is favorable for the development of Atlantic hurricanes. So every indicator that we have at an early seasonal juncture points toward potentially a very 
active, maybe even a dramatically active Atlantic hurricane season this year. Now, of course, do, is there a terribly destructive hurricane season is a different question because you could have a lot of Category 5 storms, say, that just end up spinning mostly harmlessly out over the water. You know, if they don't make landfall, they don't cause disasters in the same way, right? But if we get unlucky and a lot of those end up making a beeline for the, the Gulf Coast or the eastern seaboard of the U.S. or the Caribbean islands, it could be a whole different story. So to the extent that there's any predictability at seasonal scale about hurricanes, there's a lot of alarm bells, uh, alarm bells ringing and uh, warning lights flashing at the moment. Let's just put it that way. Another question about summer. I tackled that to the greatest extent of my ability. Comment from Tracy uh, about living in the Palm Springs area. And it was interesting to see this, this most recent weather system turning counterclockwise, uh, blowing uh, from, from the east, sending uh, over the thunderstorms and cool weather. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in the northern hemisphere, any, any low pressure system, uh, any low pressure system is always going to be, uh, have winds that, that rotate in the cyclonic direction, which in the northern hemisphere is, I always have to orient myself and do the, do the, do the clockwise curvature and, and think about it. Uh, because of course, uh, the, the flow is, is, is counterclockwise, uh, along, around, uh, as, as Tracy, uh, mentions around low pressure systems. Uh, and that's what we saw uh, with this last system, of course. But the difference was that it was located to the east. So normally, when we get that counterclockwise flow in Southern California, we're off on the eastern side of it when it's raining. So we actually get south to north flow. Uh, but of course, that's exactly how the, the clockwise directionality works. If you're on one side of the clock, uh, you're going from top to bottom. And if you're on the other side of the clock, it's bottom to top, depending on whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise. So. That's the, that's the nature of the flow. This was a bit of an unusual pattern in that it produced enough instability to generate those thunderstorms even though we were on the backside, so with that northerly and easterly flow, exactly as Tracy described. So that was part of the reason why you got such photogenic storms. They popped up over the mountains. They sort of started the weekend when they went toward the coastal areas, but not completely. Somewhat reminiscent structurally of east to west flow you get during a monsoonal pattern, but of course the underlying cause was completely different. There is no North American monsoon in place right now. This was because of a cutoff low pressure system. Question from Brent, does climate change make it harder to forecast the weather, both in long and short term? This is a question that's coming up a lot lately, and it's a claim I see a lot of tech, weather tech startups making, and I just don't think it's true. There's just no evidence, really, at scale, that climate change is making the weather less predictable. At, you know, at, in aggregate, weather predictions continue to get better. They've, they've never been better than they are today. Now, they're getting better at a slightly reduced rate, although that's mainly more a computational constraint, probably, than, than anything to do with climate change. The challenges are the edge cases for really extreme events there might be an argument that climate change is making it harder to predict. So two, two specific examples might be, for example, rapidly intensifying hurricanes. Uh, the, the, the hurricane, the Category 5 storm that blew up literally overnight and hit the west coast of Mexico last summer, resulting in catastrophic damage in El Capulco, uh, was an example of this. That was not predicted to do, to, to do so. That genuinely did uh, was a was a huge forecast failure that had large consequences and and people died and there was ex extensive damage as a result. Rapidly intensifying hurricanes is one specific place where in fact climate change might be making it harder to make good predictions and that's actually pretty concerning because those are the kinds of storms that can, you know, if you get a storm that intensifies from a tropical storm or a category one hurricane to a category four or five hurricane literally overnight and does so unexpectedly right as it's making landfall. Preparations for a Category 1 hurricane are very different than the preparations for a Category 5 hurricane, including who you need to evacuate. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe in the pollen season starting early this year. Uh, who you need to evacuate from the storm surge and flood zone, and that's critically important to get right. Uh, so that's one specific example of, uh, of a kind of weather phenomena that might we might be getting worse predictions in a warming climate because we are seeing more rapid intensification of these storms and models sometimes miss it. 
we're still trying to figure out exactly what's going on there, but that might be an edge case where there's something going on. And then also extreme heat waves. Um, there is a tendency for models to underestimate the degree of land surface couplings with the atmosphere during extreme heat waves, especially ones that are persistent, meaning the degree to which the initial bit of the heat wave dries out the soil, and then that dry soil makes it easier for additional warmth and solar radiation to further heat the atmosphere because the longer you go during the heat wave, the less moisture there is to evaporate from the soil, the more of the sun's energy gets partitioned into sensible heating, meaning warming, actually warming the temperature of the air versus latent heating, meaning evaporating water. And as that partitioning approaches the point where there's very little latent heating, there's very little water left to evaporate, then all of the sun's incoming energy is now going to heating the air. This is not a feedback process that all predictive models get right. And so that's a clear mechanism where you might get an underestimate in the magnitude of an extreme persistent heat wave. Uh, and of course, heat waves are getting worse in a warming climate, so we might expect that effect to see to see that effect more often. That same process can also result in ridges of high pressure that become a bit more persistent because, of course, the hotter the air, the stronger the ridge, the the greater the 500 millibar uh, thickness uh, thicknesses become, and so you get slightly more persistent high pressure systems. And the models don't quite capture that, and so you can see how that cascades a bit. So there are some. My point is there are some edge cases. Uh, where the most, particularly with specific kinds of extreme events, where we might see some predictive failures that are influenced by the way the climate is changing. But overall, I don't think that's likely to be true. In fact, you know, our ability to predict the weather has continuously improved over decades. It's still improving. It will likely still continue to improve. But then there is an important question about these edge cases. And I think that these edge cases are perhaps when we care the most about predictability. So there are probably other examples too, but those are the ones that come to mind right now based on recent examples. Uh, a question about tornadoes and climate change in California. I sort of talked about this earlier. The, the, the main answer is we don't know. Um, Tornadoes are not common in California, although they're also not as rare as some folks may have believed. There is weak evidence that increases broadly in the amount of convective available potential energy, which will probably increase in California, at least in, in winter and spring, which essentially would be tornado season to the extent that it exists in California, probably will increase. All else equal, that might slightly increase the, the, the likelihood of seeing thunderstorms capable of producing tornadoes. There is no research on this formally at all at this point. So the answer is there's very little evidence either way. My gut instinct says that it's plausible that there will be at least some increase in the likelihood of severe convective weather, which would include at least isolated tornadoes. I don't think California is ever going to become an epicenter for intense tornadoes because we don't really get the confluence of very high instability and very strong wind shear in the same way that you need for that. But for the kinds of, you know, isolated supercell events and tornadoes mostly on the weaker end of the spectrum that California tends to see during those mini supercell outbreaks, there is a plausible sense that those could potentially increase or expand in a warming climate. But again, no one's, th no one's run that study. If you're running it, let me know. Do I think there'll be a strong La Nina winter in 24-25? You know, we don't have great in, in, interannual predictability, but that is what the models are strongly indicating right now. It is highly likely that there'll be an, a, a, La, a significant La Nina event, so at least a moderate one this summer and fall. But if that happens, it's pretty likely it would persist into next winter, and there's a decent chance it could become strong. So the odds are probably higher than usual of a strong La Nina event next winter. I would say that right now, but it's just too early to talk about the details still. Uh, Erica asks that we seem to be getting a lot of questions about thunderstorms and clouds today. Can you speak about a little bit about pyrocumulus generating generated lightning? So this would be lightning generated by uh, what are known as pyrocumulonimbus clouds. So these literally are 
fire-generated thunderstorms. We think of these mostly in contemporary times uh, as being generated by wildfires, so uh, sort of these thunderstorm clouds that, that build and, and develop on top intense wildfires under the right uh, atmospheric conditions. You still need atmospheric instability, and that can produce lightning and other exotic behavior uh, like uh, essentially the, these fire tornadoes. We're not talking about these these fire whirls that often get called fire tornadoes. So not these small scale features that spin up on the fire line and are maybe a hundred or two feet tall and last for ten to thirty seconds. Those happen almost continuously if you've ever watched footage or ever experienced the fire line. Uh, but what I'm talking about are these full fledged uh, tornado strength, tornado size, persistent vortices that are attached to the thunderstorm base. So we have seen in recent years instances of pyrocumulonimbus clouds that produce not only lightning, but also tornadic-like vortices that have winds of anywhere from 100 to even maybe up to 200 miles an hour. They knock down trees, they can destroy buildings, they can flip over firefighting vehicles. They're actually quite a significant hazard uh, to firefighters on the fire line. Uh, they're not common, but they do occur, and we're documenting them more often. Are we, are they actually occurring more frequently, or are we just documenting them more frequently? I don't think that question has been fully resolved. It's probably, honestly, both. That maybe that, that there are more intense fires that could potentially produce them than there used to be, but also there's a lot more smartphone video uh, cameras uh, trained on them than there ever would have been 30 or 40 years ago, of course. Uh, but this is an emerging area of research, and in the severe convective weather community and the fire weather community, there's now a saying that fire weather is severe weather, and this partly comes from this notion that pyroconvective events, these fire-generated thunderstorms, or erstwhile thunderstorms that just interact with fires in some way, are, are sort of the, 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 the subject of a lot of scientific interest and have actually caused a lot of the wildfire catastrophes that we've seen around the world in recent years. So, so these features are interesting. Uh, they do generate lightning. They actually can generate new fires. In fact, I, I, I've had this conversation with a number of fire scientists. I don't know if anybody took me seriously. It's enough of an edge case that maybe nobody cares, but my... It's sort of a, if a tree falls in a woods type of question in a sense, but if a, if a wildfire generates a pyrocumulonimbus cloud, which generates lightning, which generates new fires, are those technically considered spot fires from the original fire? Usually spot fires would be caused by embers that get lofted in the fire plume and land somewhere else or get blown by strong winds, and that can happen up to several miles downwind during a major wind event. But pyrocumulus-generated lightning can happen as much as 10 to 15 miles away from the fire. So is this potentially the longest form of spotting uh, that you can get during a wildfire? It's a philosophical question that maybe doesn't matter, as I say. This is probably not of great consequence, but it does happen occasionally. And it actually does have some consequences for wildfire modeling, because it is the cause of simultaneous ignitions that are not immediately adjacent to the active fire front, but sometimes can occur a whole mountain range away, or two mountain ranges away. So interesting questions. Lightning is generated almost in the same way as it is in a normal, in a normal cumulonimbus cloud, in the sense that there's charge separation within the cloud. Um, but the interesting thing is that it does seem like the pyrogenetic uh, lightning can sometimes occur with clouds that are somewhat less impressive, if you will, uh, with lower cloud tops and uh, less uh, depth of cloud height than their non-fire generated counterparts. Getting into the weeds a bit, this is a topic of research, but there's all sorts of interesting research in the fire weather community going on uh, when it comes to pyroconvection. It is fascinating. I've seen a number of these clouds in person. I've been under a couple of, couple of them as they've as they've dropped large vortices, and they are, in some ways, the scariest cloud type you can imagine, right? Because out of nowhere, a, you know, a 200 foot column of smoke and flames just spins up right in front of you. Uh, not too many clouds that can do that, um, but definitely an interesting topic.
A uh, question from Joyce. Is the accuracy improvement in long-range weather forecast inherently limited by the sensitive sensitivity of the weather to small changes, the butterfly effect? Yes. Uh, we're never going to have, even theoretically, it's essentially impossible to have daily, you know, daily scale, city scale weather predictions like three, four, five weeks in advance. It, to the, the, the extent of our fundamental understanding about the nature of chaotic motions in a highly nonlinear coupled dynamical fluid system such as the atmosphere, it's not a matter of not having enough data or not having good enough models, but it's actually a theoretical limit to producing explicit deterministic weather forecasts more than a couple weeks in advance. Might we be able to push the envelope with an extreme outlying advance in computation or weather modeling out to maybe two weeks or three weeks with deterministic predictions? Maybe, at least under some conditions, but that's really pushing it. And I, I think the answer is probably no. But if the if you're asking about like a month out, two months out, the answer is essentially definitely no. We're never going to have, even in some multi-hundred year future where we're multi-planetary, we're still probably not going to be able to have weather forecasts a month out. The key difference being that we might actually have much better seasonal predictions probabilistic forecasts, and we might actually even have much better uh, multi-decadal climate projections. So the problem of determinism and chaos in the atmosphere becomes less and less of a problem the farther out you go because you're no longer trying to produce a specific weather forecast. You're not trying to predict the weather on March 19th, 2057 in San Francisco. You're trying to ask about the probability distribution of temperature and precipitation and other variables uh, in winter, say, in Northern California. So a much broader question that's not nearly so affected by this initial condition butterfly effect because over a long enough period of time and over large enough regions, the, the errors just kind of wash out. And what you're left with is the long-term externally forced signal. In this case, the human-caused warming signal. But uh, that's a negligible effect on weather forecast timescales, you know, the climate change today is roughly the same as the climate change we're going to be having in two weeks. And so then the question is much more related to what the actual initial state of the atmosphere is. Is there a low pressure system over Las Vegas versus a high pressure system over San Francisco right now? And exactly what is the, the spatial and temporal evolution of those systems? Those are the kind of details that matter a lot for weather forecasts, but are all essentially entirely irrelevant when we're talking about climate projections, and even seasonal predictions. A question about uh, Leon Simon's research uh, compelling the loss of aerosols and shipping fuels leading to a termination shock. There's a lot of speculation about the degree to which the recent change in in some ways, this, this sounds very esoteric, but you never know what's important sometimes at global scales. Uh, in, in shipping emissions regulations, such that the in 2022, I believe it was, there was a discontinuity where stricter pollution regulations went into effect and these highly polluting bunker fuels used in international cargo ships, which is not an insubstantial source of uh, sulfate aerosols in the atmosphere, uh, the regulations went into effect, and suddenly these ships had to burn much cleaner fuels that produced a lot less aerosol pollution, which is actually really good for public health, but may have had some consequences for the climate system because aerosols cool artificially cool the planet, just uh, just as greenhouse gases artificially warm it. The problem is that the question is an order of magnitude, and right now there's just as precious little evidence that this is a particularly large effect. It's there it probably did exert a warming effect, but the warming effect, according to the most recent research, is most likely on the order of hundredths, like 0.01s of a degree centigrade of warming over a few year period. So it's there, and it might be higher in some regions than others, because of course these ship aerosol emissions were concentrated over certain ocean basins, so your mileage may vary. Maybe it's more like, you know, 0.05 or 0.08 degrees centigrade in these localized areas, but globally, it's pretty small. It's on the order of a few hundredths. And so, frankly, it pales in comparison to the changes we've seen. 
uh, in recent years. I mean, this past year was 0.2, not 0.02, but, but 0.2 degrees Celsius warmer than the previous record warmest year. That is a huge margin and no more than maybe 5 or 10% of it at the most appears to be explainable by the ship aerosol thing. Same thing with the Hungatanga eruption, by the way. I've talked about that before. There was initial speculation that it might be a notable warming pulse. Subsequent research kind of demoted it. Uh, it's not even totally clear if that actually had a warming, a net warming influence at all, because it did inject some aerosols, which were cooling, as well as water vapor into the stratosphere, which has a net warming effect. What the balance is, is probably, once again, a matter of plus minus a few hundredths. So, uh, you know, if we got lucky, uh, if you will, maybe it's a, a couple hundredths warmer as a result. But right now, the best evidence suggests that both of those factors are at best a few hundredths of a degree centigrade each. So interesting scientifically, but not really all that consequential globally. Are those initial studies wrong? I guess it's possible. But right now, the only evidence we've got suggests that, that those influences are actually quite small. So that's an update from six to 12 months ago when I first started talking about these things. It's other stuff the prop, in, in all likelihood that's causing the warming uh, in the short term. Of course, in the long term, we know that it's human-caused uh, warming as a result of accumulated greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. That is by far the, 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 the dominant effect by almost, well, by any measure. And then you have the temporary warming effect of coming out of a La Nina into a strong El Nino. There is some debate right now in the, in the scientific community about where the extra tenth or two a degree centigrade of warming has come from. And there could be something interesting going on there that we've missed. But overall, you know, again, if you look at the smooth multi-year values, we're almost right on, on, on par with where climate models said we would be because of human-caused warming at this point, even with this warming spike included. So did something weird happen in 2023? Something probably did, at least regionally. Was it kind of random variability superimposed on top of the strong warming trend in El Nino? That is, it's possible. It's just kind of irreducible internal variability. But it is also possible we're missing something. Perhaps one of these influences stronger than we believed. Maybe there's some other factor that we're completely missing. Research continues. A question... Uh, Going back to the pyroconvective weather and fire tornadoes I talked about earlier, can these fire tornadoes be picked up on radars and perhaps forecasted one day? Yes, they can be picked up on radars. In fact, I am now aware of at least one National Weather Service tornado warning that was issued for a pyrogenetic vortex. This was by the Weather Service, I believe it was in Reno, and it was uh, near the, the Nevada-California border on a fire a few years back. I think it was the Royalton fire, maybe? Anyway, uh, point being, you get a rotational, if you've been watching some of the live sessions I had this winter where I showed these rotational velocities during these potentially tornadic water spout spin-ups during these winter storms, you see a similar rotational signature on radar in the pyrocumulonimbus plume during such fire tornado events. So I do think we have not seen the last National Weather Service tornado warning for a fire tornado. Uh, we know that they've happened before in Australia. You can see them on radar. You could probably see some in Canada if they had more radar sites, but Canada is sufficiently population sparse in a lot of areas. We don't really have a lot of ground-based radar. You can't see them from satellite that's too far away, but you can see these if they're close enough to a radar site. So we will see them in the western U.S. often when they occur. Weather Service can issue warnings for them. The prediction question is very interesting because that's actually really tricky because you need to predict first the behavior of the fire, which is really hard, and then the meteorology that occurs as a feedback from that. So right now we can't predict them more than sort of now casting, but we can detect them when they're in their incipient stages of development, and that might still be useful. You can definitely see them on radar when they're occurring if there's a radar site nearby.
All right. Well, I think uh, we're a little beyond the hour, and this served as a nice uh, Ask Me Anything session. We had some wide-ranging questions. Um, the connections seem to hold up, which is good. Um, I don't think there were any major interruptions, which is nice to see. Uh, so maybe I will uh, leave it with that. Uh, oh, yeah, by the way, Marty Walters remarks, was it the Loyalton fire in 2020 near Reno? And the answer is yes, that was the fire I was referring to, I believe. Uh, thanks for joining, as always. And I'm going to try and get on a more regular schedule. My, my travel schedule was nuts in early March, and it is relenting. Now I just have to catch up on all the work that I didn't do during the work travel. <laughs> it's funny how that, how that works. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks for joining. I'll, uh, this, as always, will be available as a recording, and I will try and get on that regular schedule. One thing I'm interested in testing out is whether there are specific times that are better for people for some of the more regularly scheduled sessions. I might send out another poll on that soon. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, and with that, um, I think I'll call it an afternoon. Thanks for joining. Uh, and uh, enjoy the spring-like weather this week.